Welcome, Lorelei Bernanke. I hope they have your name right. Yes, you do. Um, to the Institute for Advanced Astonishment. Lorelei, Professor Lorelei Bernanke wrote um, a oh, beautiful hi. book called The Manner of Wonder. Yes, that. <laughs> and you wrote other books and edited books on panentheism yeah, yeah, and on Tantra. Good. Yes, that. <laughs> Oh, well, but okay. I love. <laughs> okay. So I read okay. all of that and your book, um, Panentheism, the World's Traditions. Which... I don't have a copy of that right here. So I, I was like, okay. I have it here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so welcome to the Institute for Advanced Astonishment. And I'll just give you a quick rundown of what we're about here. We we take the M on astonishment, which might be your wonder, and the W on wonder and flip it to an M and stretch it to like M to the third um, and the number one M to keep me on track during the three M's. So matter, which is all we're going to talk about uh, medicine, which you, if you want to dive into that, like the, 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 the ego dissolvers that show us well, sometimes the direct just, experience. Well, just so you know, I, I just, this semester I'm teaching a class on, um, psychedelics religion psychedelics and shamanism it's a seminar so it's uh it's a it's it's a good lively group of students there's a there's a real a re, you know partly because of the sort of um efforts towards decriminalization there's a really big push right now across the yes. country to sort of so so there's yeah it's, it's and, fun. and the push seems a little a little more um guided than the 60s where it was a little like wild now it's a little calmer. Let's look at the yeah. studies. Let's learn yeah. from. The, don't be Timothy Leary and give out handfuls of MDMA or mushrooms. <laughs> Take it the right way. The set in the setting matters, and yeah. you know. So Although that's you, great. You, you may have heard about. I mean, I'm I'm derailing your sort of three M's, but we'll get back to it in a second. I hope. But um, <laughs> but you may have heard also about the um the recent um the guy the Alaskan Airlines pilot who was, uh, went to uh, Portland to sort of, um, he's quite depressed, a friend had died. He took um, mushrooms as a way of, you know, trying to cope with the, the grief he was feeling. And then, um, and uh, he couldn't sleep for 40 hours, got on a plane to go to uh, back home in California. And then somehow, it, because he, he got to stay in the upfront cockpit because he's a, an active flyer for Alaska yeah. Airlines. And then they, then he just felt this sense of derealization and decided that he needed to wake up the pilot. So he tried to shut the engines of the plane off. And then, oh. yeah. And so, and they had a little bit of a time. They tackled him and they got him out of the cockpit, saved the plane, you know, decided instead to sort of like land in Portland. And um, he's now, it's very sad. He's now sort of like facing a, an arraignment of like, you know, 83 counts of attempted murder, you know. Oh, but, oh. I know. Yeah. That's going to probably. All I could hear while you said that is the great line from the razor's edge, the novel or the movie, if you've seen where he's trying to convey, he goes to the mountaintop to a Ramana Maharshi kind of guy, like your guy that you write about and has this beautiful transformative experience, the whole thing. And when he comes back, he wants to stay on the mountaintop and the teacher says, no, you must go back to the city. And he brings it to the woman he loved and he tries to compare it to like being in a plane and above the clouds and how it's so transcendent. It's all I could hear, but I didn't realize it was going to be. Uh, Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. Well, once yeah. in a while, yeah, don't take it on a plane. No, apparently he take, he'd taken it 48 hours earlier. And I think right. that what's a, the, the contention point at this point, I think, is that, okay, um, most people say it's done within six to seven hours, but apparently there are some people who will still feel a sense of derealization. Yes even up to a week. And so like, right. new one, you can't fly well, on a flight unless you've been a week off and, and you can't. I agree. Them. That's very <laughs> good. I, and, and I like to see um, those limits that we put on things like MDMA is like a four hour yeah. and mushrooms might be a six hour and LSD might be an eight hour. But once you hit that status that we're going to, that state, that advanced astonishment wonder state, on it you realize that that's just a symbol in this dream of and you can if you could put a crowbar in it you could extend that to longer and yes. he might have been riding it out he shouldn't have gotten on a yeah, yeah, plane yeah. on a bird in the sky 
It's yeah, too much. It's yeah. like taking it on a flying carpet. It's too much. So the third M yeah. would be yeah. um, mind training yeah. or you know, meditation. This is right. This is right. Um, uh-huh. Okay. Oh, sorry. Yoga. Yeah, I was saying the third M, there's a little lag. So um, the third one is yoga, basically, huh? Yeah, yoga, retraining, seeing that perceptual oh, yeah. error and correcting it. Yes, totally. And I really am interested um, during our talk, if we can get into uh, maybe later. And it's so crazy for me from a, a amazing Randy skeptical background to even entertain, but I did. And I love your um, part about the sun magic and how you can. Uh, yeah. Yeah. If we can get into that later, uh, that would be great. But maybe in the beginning, we can just talk about the difference between pantheism and panentheism. Great. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so basically, um, uh, the main difference between pantheism and panentheism is that panentheism, um, it's kind of, I like to describe it sometimes, it's just kind of have your cake and eat it too, okay? Because basically what you have is this idea of like divinity is both completely in the world, but also has a sense of transcendence as well. I mean, and you can see this in Indian philosophy, you can see it, it goes all the way back to the Rig Veda in the Purusha, in the Purusha Sukta. Um, there's this sort of this line there, it says, you know, three quarters I mean, one quarter of the Purusha, the divine, the sort of, you know, the cosmic being, uh, one quarter of the Purusha is actually here below and three quarters are up above sort of in, yes. in a transcendent space. And I think that's a pretty good panentheistic vision because it's the idea here is that um, the divine or the cosmic being makes up all of what we see here and we are all a part of it. But um, there's also this part of it, which is actually um, beyond this here, this this world here, and so and so panentheism is both. It's sort of it's the it's that which extends beyond, and it's also all of that we see here as well. Where so pantheism, so, if you had to define pantheism, it would just be so here. Is, yeah. Yes. P yes. Pantheism is everything here is is made up that absolute. Now the difference also is what, one of the things you'll see. You probably saw this in some of Mary Jane's work as well too the idea of pantheism is considered you know dangerous partly because um you don't have a sort of governing uh, authority and i think that is it is i think that's um i mean in, in one sense pantheism sort of is maybe a little bit more amenable to an evolutionary theory because of the fact that um you don't have a sort of overarch some sort of like guy got some somebody above the show guiding it there's no director whereas for panentheism you do now you can also have the same kind of evolutionary trajectory with panentheism as well. So it's not, it, it doesn't preclude it. It just sort of um, has this probably comforting notion that there is beyond this reality, there is a sort of higher truth cosmic being that is sort of um, uh, able to sort of both be this and also to be beyond. So you get a sort of bird's eye view of everything in panentheism, which you don't get in pantheism. Pantheism is just everything around us is made up of this cosmic mind or divinity, whatever, however you want to use this word. I mean, we maybe we can come up with a good a good word for this. This sort of like, you know, because like, you know, God is not what? I use pure imagination, but to keep the religion, the yeah. religious part, out, like just yeah. pure imagination, but there's so many immortal yeah. consciousness, the absolute. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. For for Indian traditions in general, you know, they they kind of sure there's God there a lot, but often there's this idea that, you know, forget about God. We don't care about God. You know, what we care about is uh, you know, this sort of like this this cosmic being ends, yeah. you know, you know, and but that 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 cosmic being, now it's not just an absolute because when we say the word absolute, we always we get kind of caught up in this idea that um yes. it's kind of it's an abstract reality. And the thing about this, and this is what I love about Abhinav Gupta, is he sort of brings it back to this notion it's not an abstract, it's an intentional reality. This yes. is this cosmic force. That's uh, we could call it cosmic force. I mean, I like to think of yeah. that uh, that uh Dylan um uh what's his name? Um that Dylan, Dylan Thomas. Yeah, Dylan Thomas poem where he saw the green shoot that pushes yes. through. Yeah. So that, that and that and that in that respect, it's um, it's it's a force, but it's also has intention. And I think yeah. that's sort of and that's where I think where, where people. You know, 
pulled astray with to sort of like push aside the notion of um this notion of, of intentionality um and I mean, you see that also. Um, well, there's so many things to talk about. I'm going to make a couple of notes here. Up time to up, and okay? I think you say in the book, but it might not be you. I can't, I've so many things I've prepared uh -huh. for this talk. I've been waiting. Um, it might not be you, but you might agree with it that there's nothing else that this can do. This cosmic, you know, this is what it does. This is. Uh, it's not like an intention in a in a it can't help but do this. I think my Eckhart would say, the mystics would say, this is what it, I don't know how to word it. It's just what it would do. There's no way for it to not do this. This is what it does, which is love. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, um, yes. I, I mean, I, I, yeah, that sounds good. I mean, uh, I think that sounds good. <laughs> No, it sounds good. I mean, obviously we'll sort of like get into the weeds and see, well, what do we actually yes. mean by love? What do we actually mean by, yes. you know, I mean, there is this in, in, in these Indian traditions, particularly for the tantric traditions, there is this idea that um, it's not, it, it, adds, it actually does have free will. And you might appreciate this a little, but um, you know, there's this, uh, contemporary neuroscientist um, Tononi, Giulio Tononi, who's working on this theory called integrated information theory. And I've gotten really interested in this theory because I think it's, I think he's spot on. And a couple of things that he does is he sort of brings in this idea of, of, um, he brings in this idea of, of subjectivity, which I think is absolutely key. Actually, um, initially, um, I, they they were they were basically were I think they were trying to sort of hide this whole notion of of subjectivity because it's really taboo in a Western science and so I actually I wrote an article where I basically said okay look you say intrinsic but that's really an a, a, an obscurantist type term what you really mean is subjectivity and then um, but then um, a couple of years after that they completely shifted and they started saying yep subjectivity you know they still now, use wait, the word for one second can you make I know exactly what you're saying and I agree and it's all subject. But what do you mean for like the younger me who might not understand that? What do you mean uh -huh. by subjectivity? I, I get it, but right. let's really get. <laughs> okay. um, oh, this is great. Yeah. What I, um, what I mean is um, a first person perspective. So yeah. most of our science is driven me by a third person perspective. Yeah, objectivity. And I think that you can sort of shift the way we, so many things we can shift the way we think about them and so many problems that we've had um, before uh, with, with our science and with ideas of mind-body connection actually go away if we actually start to sort of think more in terms of let's approach this from a first-person perspective. From, from the, And that's what that's really the beauty of Abhin Abhagupta's philosophy. He actually sort of gets rid of yeah. so many of the problems, the mind-body problem for um, Indian philosophy because they have the same problem that we have. Sankhya has the same problem. Uh, Advaita Vedanta has the same problem, and he he actually solves the problem by um, bringing in a, a shift in perspective, which is a first person perspective. That's okay. it. Yeah. Yeah. That shift is everything. Yeah. Yeah, and you can see this. I mean, you can see this a little. So to, to bring it back a little bit to Tononi and, and IIT 3.0, or maybe at this point it's 4.0 um, with these ideas, but Tononi also this contemporary neuroscientist. Um, for the inform integrated information theory, he also talked a podcast about this at one point. He's talking about this idea of free will, okay? And so, um, and one of the things he he points out is that um, free will is crucial. And one of the things you need for free will is you need actually intentionality and you need a first person perspective, you know. And so, free will is 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 um a, is um a reality, okay? So that means that the deity or the um cosmic force. It's not, it's not that it cannot do otherwise. It can, because free will guarantees that there's always a choice, okay? Right. For anything that's sentient, you know, and as Abhi Navagupta would say, even down to the, you know, a worm, whatever is sentient has yeah. this sort of free will, okay? And we do too, we have free will. I mean, we, we you know, we cover up our own uh, sense of free will. Um, these are the, the, uh, uh, the Avern, Averna, these sort of coverings of, of Avarnas, these coverings that sort of prevent us from sort of having our a recognition of our own innate sort of mastery of reality. Um, so we cover those up by, you know, uh, misconstruals of like what the nature, what it is to be in a body. Okay, but but the at the base of it always is this sense of free will, you know, for the yeah. for the absolute cosmic force. And that means there's also this sense of intentionality and there's a first person perspective. Yeah. And even as a materialist atheist in my day, 
Dennett, Daniel Dennett, I'm sure you're very familiar, wrote about intentionality, the intentional stance, and he wrote about free will, even though he didn't buy it. He said, but there's the sense. We have to yeah. act as if we have. So yeah. there is that feeling, yeah. you know. I, mean, so I, it's, love that. I do I do love da Daniel Dennett's work. And part of the reason I love it is because he's the perfect straw man for what I write. Yes. <laughs> yes, he really is. He really. I mean, I, and I Hofstetter, use Hofstetter. A little I, bit. Like, I think he's a little bit more interesting in terms of okay I think he's more interesting in terms of that I think his his theories are a lot more nuanced than Dennett's I mean but uh, I, having said that the thing about Dennett is that he actually I, I think he's actually sort of like um following through with the logical conclusions of his theory so to say that you know mind is is an epi uh, is an epiphenomenon which is like the a burp of the brain um you know it's actually the logical conclu conclusion of his basic ideas i mean we right. the, the, it doesn't it doesn't mesh with our actual experience um but it's but it is the logical conclusion is what you have to come to if you want to if you want to stick yes. with this materialism you have no other options you know so that's people what just... i love about him that he loves and i felt the same way as an atheist skeptic i don't know where you were 20 years ago but uh he loves cathedrals daniel dennett we talked and he loves um churches he loves uh uh devotional music like bach he loves it but he can't logically get there in the mind obviously but he loves these big spaces and the stained glass windows and the whole the whole thing i don't know if we just froze mm -hmm. or not. yeah oh, a little good. it's yeah. fine as far as i'm oh. concerned it's fine yeah yeah there might be a storm yeah, i think we're getting a hurricane from el salvador here i don't know that's what i heard this okay. morning Hey. <laughs> and I brought this on for you because your whole book is about this clay cup right here. Oh, right. good. Right? Yeah, good. That's good. That's a um, big okay, thing. Okay, so that's not something I made up. No. It's it's part of all of classical Indian philosophy uses the clay pot as its sort of standard sort of like, um, you know, it's an icon metaphor for, you know, how, what, what you used to discuss things with, you know. So I didn't, I, I just use the text are talking about clay pots right and left. <laughs> yeah. So how do we explain this to someone who's just tuning in? Why did you and why do the Hindus talk about a clay pot and the subject uh, and the object? Yeah, I mean, it's just because everybody knows about, I mean, clay pots are ubiquitous. It's what people, you know, used to drink out of. It's, you know, everybody's got a clay pot. So it becomes a very easy sort of um, uh, emblem to sort of uh, point to um, matter. Yeah. You know, so the so philosophers are talking about clay pots all the time because everybody so knows solid. what a clay pot is. Yeah. <laughs> solid. <laughs> yeah. And also, and also because it helps you think about things of like, um, you know, a clay pot has a certain form. Okay, so how did it get its form? Well, there was a potter, someone who actually gave it that particular form. It's That's matter, it, it's earth, and but then earth transforms and becomes into a particular thing. And, you know, there's a person who makes it into that particular thing. And so the clay itself is just sort of the, is, is the material um, cause, but, it's, but there's also sort of an instrumental cause, et cetera, yeah. So um, th can we introduce everyone to this amazing panentheist from about a thousand years ago? I could try yeah. to say the name, but you should Abhinava say it. Gupta. Okay, yes. Abhinava Gupta. And you can just call him Abhinava for short as well. It's fine. Yeah. Well, Gupta. Gupta is really easy. <laughs> yeah, but it's better to call him Abhinava. Yeah. Gupta. Abhinava. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and his idea is... Uh, yeah, I mean, so he's got a number of really important ideas, but the main idea is this philosophy called Pratyabhijna, which basically means the a philosophy of recognition. Okay, and that is is that um, re tr really and truly um, we already are this um, cosmic absolute, every one of us, everything that is, and we don't recognize that because we haven't sort of um, because we're sort of caught up in these um uh these these he they call them mullahs these sort of like coverings of of uh, grime you know mullahs and impurity um which are and there's three different types of these mullahs and um we don't and because of these three types of mullahs which is basically the mullah uh uh, uh so basically um uh 
we don't have to get into too much, but in any case, um, because we don't see this, we actually sort of wind up um, not understanding that we are this absolute and that this philosophy is all about sort of getting to the point where we actually recognize that we are, in fact, the, the absolute. Which is very close or exactly the old um, Hindu saying, Tattavama, see, you, thou, thou art that, you are, you yeah. are it. Yeah, the relative is the absolute or the samsara is nirvana. Can yeah. I say that? Yeah, I yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's good. No, that, that's a good, that's a Buddhist idea, right? The samsara is nirvana. It comes, you know, that's Nagarjuna. And um, yes. um, yeah, so um, yeah. So basically everything that exists is this cosmic um, force, this cosmic reality, which is... Um, but what Abhinava does is when he brings it to this first person perspective, he, he also allows it a kind a um a personal quality as well. So this is also what allows a kind of a bhakti to sort of like a kind of yeah. devotional stance to sort of be amenable to this. Now you don't need that for his philosophy. Um you really don't need it at all. What you need is just simply a first person perspective in it. Okay. But it yeah. does make it easier to sort of accommodate things like devotion and love. Right. You know. Yeah. So that's sort of, um, you know, so, so, so basically we are, so when we have a certain kind of state of recognition, then, um, then when we, we suddenly, often suddenly, but it doesn't have to be suddenly, but, um, when we get this recognition, this, this prachavichna, then we actually sort of realize, oh, we are this, this absolute, you know, we I are. It could be gradual. It could be sudden. And then you can go back into amnesia. Yeah. And then it can gradually take, it takes a while. And that's what this whole channel is about. How do you make, we don't have to get into that right this second, but how do you make this recognition, this realization baseline or close to yeah. your baseline frequency? Because I love that you said it's not just sudden and it, some, sometimes it doesn't stick and we right. need to take the medicine or we need to go on a mountaintop or we need to go a little yeah. quiet. And then we also need to return to the people. We need to mesh and make the mountain mountain again, you know, make it all come yeah. back. I mean, so so this is where you get this idea called uh, Jivan Mukti, okay, which is where a person is um, enlightened while still in a living body. And that's one of the things that Tantra brings about. Because if you look at the traditions before, what you see is that, yes, you'll get enlightened, but it'll happen for some early Tantra as well. You'll get enlightened, but it happens when you die, you know, or right. this idea that if you're in a body, you can't, you're not going to be there. Okay. There is this, that idea. And it's, that there's some good things about that idea because what it does is it sort of like um, prevents a certain hubris from taking hold yeah, of someone. That's who's good. Yeah. So that's, that's one of the advantages of this, you know, ascetic tradition, this notion that, um, that, you know, if you're in a body, you're not going to be there. But and I um, think Buddha would, would say that's like the, I don't know the right word, but there's, dying before you die which you're going to get to right now i'm sure and then there's that body dropping at death where it's like the bigger so there's an enlightenment or a illumination or a realization dying before you die but then there's actual physical death and yeah. whatever you want to call it and that's a bigger Yes, I, I know there's a word, but I don't yeah, know. well, that it's part in party nirvana. So there's nirvana, ah, that's it. Like yes. going out, yeah, and then there's the party nirvana, which happens, you know, when he actually leaves the body. Um, yeah. you know, so I mean, no, so the these Sandhya traditions, you know, don't actually necessarily subscribe to this idea that, um, not in time, I mean, they do, they're, they're a little bit more, they're flexible, I would say, but they don't necessarily subscribe to this idea that you can, um, be, because it's a, it's a identitarian philosophy that you are this absolute. So why would you not be able to have it in a body? You know? So like, right. you know, so it is, it's here always, you just have to recognize it, you know, now, but it is true that if you want to keep that, you know, as you, as you said, if you want to have it be your baseline, you need you need some, you know, because the body has its own tendencies, I think you want to be able to keep it um, in, you want to be able to keep it at a, at a, a state where it can actually sort of, um, where you can keep remembering. And I'll give you a little story here, because I think it's a good story. It's about, have you ever heard of this um, Shankara, the um, eighth century Indian philosopher? Yes, one okay, of my so favorites. Okay, good. So this comes from a, a hagiography of him. And it was so it was basically written about um, eight year, 800 years after he died. Okay, so um, so it's, it's a story about Shankar's life. And in, and in this particular story, what happens is um, 
Shankara has a debate with um, uh, Mandana Mishra and his wife Bharati, and he's trying to. And whoever loses the debate, debate has to be is gets uh, has to you know gets converted to um, the philosophy of the winner. Okay, Love that's. That. Those are the terms of the debate. And so um, Shankara is debating uh, Mandan Mishra. And Shankara, you know, he's an ascetic. He's never actually had sex his entire life. Okay. Uh-huh. So so he's having the debate. And then Padati, um, Mandan Mishra's wife, basically, um, she says, well, um, okay, now, you know, uh, if your philosophy is supposed to cover everything, it also needs to be able to cover love and sex so you know so so we're going to so we're going to ask you questions about that and shankar has a little bit i mean okay i'm reading into this but he has a little bit of a panic attack right and he's like <laughs> i'm just saying that whatever he, but he says he's like okay he's like okay let's have a little a break in our session here so he's like i need to sort of let's have a little break so basically and, and he says okay so they have a little break and he has to figure out he's like in, in one month we'll come back and we'll resume the debate and i'll tell you about love and um and sex and love okay and so um so what does Shankara do he's like okay he goes into a deep meditative state and then he decides um okay so now what i'm going to do is i'm gonna in his meditative state he basically looks around and realizes there's a king um who just died not so long ago, Amaruka. And so basically he basic um he sort of and I love the text because it sort of describes in detail how the process that he takes of moving this sort of prana energy of the cell up through his body, out the top of his head. He he exits out the top of his head, he goes into through the top of the head of the dead king's body, and um, and then the king sort of basically the people around him oh near death experience the king pops back up a lot ah. okay? and like as we yeah. see many near death experiences when they come back they're a lot wiser in this case the king is so much wiser and his ministers <laughs> are like oh we got a good one here you know like <laughs> so and so you know so they kind of know it's sort of a yogi walk in and we don't we just think oh near death experience you know but um but they think okay um he's this is he's actually so much wiser than he was before and so shankara basically <clears throat> goes um and he and he takes care of the matters of the state and is re- ruling things in a really wonderful efficient just and and productive way and everybody's very very happy and then he goes and squirrels himself inside the harem because he has to learn about sex in order to win his debate okay what happens though is while he's squirreled away in the harem he forgets that he has this debate he, gets, he falls in you know he just falls into the state of like really enjoying this life of you know the, the body and sex yeah. with these and the month passes by and he hasn't come back. And so his disciples are sort of distressed. They're like, look, why is he back? He's got this debate. What are we going to do? So they basically sort of search around and try to find, um, they you know, ask around, are there any kings that have just died recently? And then they hear about this one king who um, he died, he came back to life and he came back as a very just king. So they're like, oh, that's probably our man. And so they basically, now they have to figure out how do they get him to sort of, uh, how, do, how are they going to get him to sort of like wake up again? So they have to go to the um, court and they disguise themselves as musicians and they get into the in the king's court and then they start singing these, you know, glorious songs about asceticism and enlightenment. And that eventually wakes Shankara up. Okay. And so then he sort of, then basically um, the king sort of falls down dead. Now that must've been horrible for the musicians there. They're in the court and then this king, their king just suddenly dies. And okay, right. so the king falls down dead again. Shankara leaves the body, goes back to his original body and is able to resume the debate. Now, what's so interesting about this story here is that um, here's Shankara, he's um, this enlight- enlightened, for this hagiography, he's this enlightened master. You know, the one who, who know he knows the absolute, he knows the truth, he knows about stuff. But even him, even he in who is like so enlightened, when he gets in a body, um, he sort of loses it. He can't remember. That's perfect. That's yeah. so perfect. Yeah. He can't remember and he gets stuck in the body, he needs someone to nudge him because the power of the body is yes. extremely it's the the body is extremely powerful and it it's it's not and this is one of the things i think uh, one of the points i think that we sort of neglect we think that we're just consciousness this also by the way is why i mean we can go into this more if we have time but this i think is the reason why people like ray kurzweil with their ideas of sort of downloading consciousness it's yeah. never ever going to work uh, so so i wrote an article about this like why downloading consciousness into a robot body will never ever work and that's because the body itself influences um, what we think, what we feel, as it did with Shankara, who's this very enlightened master. Maybe he gets in a king's yeah. body, like all about he sex. He yes. forgot. Yeah, you know, yeah. So you I know, love that. yeah. 
There's yeah. that old story. It's 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 a, a short one, but I'm sure you know it. Where the the guy climbs the mountain to find the guru. There's the guru with the beard at the top. And tell me how life is like a dream. I heard life is like a dream. Tell me. And the master says, go get me a glass of water down in the village. So the guy trudges down the mountain, gets the glass of water in a bar, falls in love with the bartender. She's so beautiful. <laughs> he has a family. He has little girls, little boys. He has a whole family. He's totally helping the village. And then in the story, a flood or a fire comes. And as it comes and it takes over his whole family and kill, and now it comes to him right as it does that uh -huh. he wakes up on the top of the mountain and the master says that's how it's like a dream okay and that's the same okay. thing like right it's a uh -huh. he had to go into the whole seductive right. uh body can right. we say seductive or is that well like i mean what, like, okay so what these tantrics would say is that um uh, I mean, because the seductive means that we're prioritizing the, the you know, right. this idea of an abstract conscious spirit or something outside of the body. And you can do that a little bit, I think. But um, Ten but there's also tenacious, tenacious. Well, also, the, maybe, maybe it's not as bad as we think. Like maybe the, the body is just as real and the body is just as important. OK. And so um, so it becomes more of um, and that's what I like about these tantrics. You know, you probably have heard of this text called the Vijnana Bhairava. Um, it's a I'm it's sure. a. It's, um, I can write the name in the chat if you would like. Yes, you know, that would be great. Thank you. Right for let me do that right away. Um, so basically, it is. Um, I don't know if my computer is going to. I don't think my right. That's on the okay. Chat. I won't give you diacritics, but okay. Okay, but um, comment. Okay, <laughs> okay, but in any case, this is a uh, probably. I think it's like a seventh century or sixth to seventh century text, and um, it's one of the early tantric texts, and um, and what this text talks about a lot is all of these ways that you can sort of suddenly get a, some, at least a taste of enlightenment through very ordinary activities. So like right. if you, when you're about to sneeze, if you catch the sort of a hold of like the state of mind at the beginning of a sneeze or at the end of a sneeze, you can actually move into a state right. of, of, of awareness of the self. Okay. You know, so there's yeah, all it these. It doesn't have to be this big mountaintop experience. It could be right. a sneeze. That's cool. It could be a sneeze, even like he talks about like running or like remembering, you know, feelings of love. I mean, the book actually yeah. has 112 different little exercises that uh -huh. where a person can sort of like use these sort of really everyday sorts of happenings as a way of sort of shifting into a sort of um, a deeper altered state. Now they all bring different types of experiences and they all sort of, and each of these follow there's um, in this whole philosophy, there's um, they characterize different methods as, um, as um, anava upaya, which means um, a very sort of physically oriented method. Opaya means it's upaya from, you know, the Buddhist upaya skillful teaching. So a very sort of like, something based on materiality, something, or it could be Shakta Upaya, uh, which is basically um, using the sort of, more using the mind, Shambhava Upaya, where you sort of use a sort of direct insight to get um, an, an enlightenment experience. And then, um, you know, Anupaya, which is like, it just happens, okay? Yes. And so there's, those are the four methods. And so in, in the, the book, the, the text basically, or one of the early translators, um, Jaidev Singh, he actually sort of characterizes each of these methods along the, the lines of one of these um, one of these methods, okay? And so- two, you know, two, Oh, sorry. Oh, no, you go ahead. Oh, you go two ahead. quick things. I'm so glad you gave us um, some kind of technique because a big part of this podcast is someone struggling somewhere and it's nice to have a tool of yeah. how to get along on the path so we yeah. always look for what's the best and the second thing really quickly is that you're stating something that one of my favorite mystic uh uh people thomas merton i'm sure you love would say uh the gate of heaven is everywhere so it's yeah. between a sneeze it's when you wake up in the morning with your coffee whatever it's always there, like mm -hmm. Kabir, the Sufi would say, it's in your breath. It's right at the breath. It's right. Yeah. 
doesn't have well, to okay, be. So here's the thing. It won't be everywhere. Okay. But it's uh, th that reality is present, but this, but these portals are not everywhere. They're only in certain States. So, you know, so when you cough, you, you won't be able to sort of use that as an entree, but you can use a sneeze as an entree. And that's because ah. if you have a sneeze, it's different. Like that's why we say, God bless you. Because what we know from sort of folklore is that when a person sneezes, they sort of leave the body for a, a fraction of a second. And so we want them to be protected in that moment when they're sort of in a liminal state you know so you right. know so so there's only there's there's some techniques there's not 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 everything is i mean it is the case for all of this philosophy that um this cosmic force reality is present everywhere so in that sense yes every anything you do can good but these but techniques pockets can, like little there's better like, yeah and, and of course the breath as you know with computer yes. the breath is always one for every for every every one of these traditions the breath is actually one of the most key yeah. ways I mean, for your people who are watching the podcast who want to sort of find a method, the breath is actually very tricky because um, breath work can um, can also um, breath work needs a lot of for tantric practice. Breath work needs quite a lot of guidance. OK, you know, because you, you can sort of, you know, go on a, a not so great path with breath work i mean um well just just so you just i'll give a little bit um just so you know um so i've done a lot of meditation okay so probably about um you know, the whole 10,000 hours makes a person an expert. Yes, yes. So I've done probably about 35,000 hours. That's great. Yeah. So, you know, um, so and um, um and with, with a number of different teachers. And one of the things that um, that I've seen um, through these, you know, various traditions, um, the breath is a little bit more like, you know, some kinds of medicines that you might take that sometimes it's fantastic. And other times you get on a plane and you try to, you know, stop the engines, you know. Uh, right. So, yeah. You know, yeah. So, you know, so, so basically, um, so the breath is good, but you, it's good to have a good teacher if you're, if you're going to use breath work, you know? Totally. Yeah. I mean, um, uh, if, if people want, I think mantras are actually for the tantric traditions, one of the main go-tos is always mantra. Okay. You know, so that's sort of like, you know, people, mantras are sort of like one of the main ways that people sort of, um, you know, allow themselves to, as you, you know, talked about earlier, got to find a technique to sort of keep you at this baseline okay right. and mantras are probably the main technique that most yeah. of the tantric indian tantric traditions use to sort of get to this baseline again I and, agree. you know why are mantras so you know so good are they better than say i don't know um visualizations mm, the, the indian tradition seems to think so these hindu indian yeah. tradition seem to think so okay we can think about we could we can ponder and think about why but that's definitely what the tradition sort of leans towards. Read, Mantras uh, are sort of like the. Salinger's book, Franny, Franny and Zoe. I don't know if you have a. No, I've heard it mentioned. Even like the other day, someone mentioned, I saw someone well, mentioning wrote, it, but I haven't read Jamie it. Jamie Salinger wrote Catcher in the Rye and was a big deal. And the big hit of the town in New York and all over. And then he retreated and. He wrote Franny and Zoe and a bunch of, and it was all Advaita Vedanta, like his whole life after. And he dropped out of the public eye and he wrote eight hours a day, all about what we're talking about. And any he, he fell into the um, the Swami, he loved Vivekananda and fell into uh, the Swami Society in New York City. And, okay. and so, yeah, he was very involved in this. And so in Franny, which is a 30 page little short story, he it's a girl who comes home from college, meets her boyfriend. They're eating uh, escargot and they're just talking. <laughs> they're young and she's hiding this book, constantly hiding this book that he clearly sees. She's showing it and hiding it and showing. And he finally says, what is that book? And it's a it's called The Way of the Pilgrim. It's a Russian mystic book with no author. And it's all about the idea of ceaseless prayer through mantra. It's, once you learn to say a mantra in the book, it was, I think the Lord's prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. But it could be whatever. It could be like Dorothy, yes. there's no place like home. There's no place like home. And whatever it is. And both of them figure out while they're talking, oh, how does that mantra work? Well, it sort of throws a monkey wrench into the monk, into that monkey mind. And it stops it by saying repeatedly over and over this one thing. And he started to feel joy after maybe saying it 5,000 times a day and just saying it in his heart and quietly. And it stopped the mind and brought him to the the heart or the core of consciousness or what you're talking about. 
Good. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. That's good. That, I think that's really beautiful. No place like home. <laughs> I mean, you you do have, and you have to, you have to have one that um, the mantra has to be one that you actually can sincerely sort of believe in. That's good. Yeah. You have to be behind it. That's good. Yeah. yeah. So, wait. Sure. So, so you said, and I love this, uh, matter is consciousness. Um, I might quote it a little loosely. Matter is consciousness, consciousness unfolded, and this is my favorite part, in a kind of, kind of materiality and kind of, I accent. So matter is consciousness in a kind of materiality. Can you just speak on that? That's big. Sure, <laughs> sure yes. Um, yeah. Um, okay, so um, the reason why I sort of do that, use that qualifier there is because, um, you know, in, in these Indian traditions, <laughs> we have this notion of the subtle body. And so, and it's, and the subtle is, uh, it's, it's key. And so like, if we think of matter, okay, you know, this little, this pen, you know, matter, yes. but, um, but there's also this idea that, yeah, like, yeah, the clay pot, um, but there's also this idea that, um, that there is also a subtle, a subtle reality, a subtle body reality. Now this, this goes all the way back to, um, Sankhya theory, which, um, you know, basically when, um, you know, so leave, for Sankhya theory, we're going to leave aside this notion of consciousness as Purusha, but when Prakriti nature unfolds, it basically starts to, it first unfolds from this sort of unmanifest, from there it moves into the intellect, which is the like this aha kind of reality called, it's buddhi, okay, from there it moves into ahankara, which is basically the ego, the I will do, literally I doing, okay, and from there, I'm oh, sorry, um, and there, and from there, it has to make a choice. Okay. And this, this choice is influenced by, um, the three gunas, which are sort of the, the quality of purity, sattva, the quality of agitation, rajas, or the quality of sort of dense, you know, dull stupidity, tamas. And so it's influenced by these qualities. And so when it makes its choice, it'll take either the path of, of uh, one path to one side, lead, the side of purity leads to the creation of the mind. Okay. And out of the mind, you get sort of from this purity, of the, which is sattva, which is the mind, you then get things like, um, um, the uh the five senses and the capacity you know, and and the capacities of an of a of an, a being to sort of you know do things like grasp things and hold things if it takes the path of tamas which is the path of dull stupidity which is akin to you know then it becomes first the five subtle elements of of nature which would be the subtle forms of water fire air earth and space um and then from there it, it gets more solidified and becomes the five elements that we know of. So the pen is, this pen is maybe made up a little bit of mostly earth, you know, cause plastic is going to be mostly earth, you know, yes. a little bit of water. The ink is a little bit of liquid. The water part has a water element to it. I don't know if it has much fire in it, maybe a little, you know, but so, um, um, so the five in space, of course, these, so the five elements in the, are, are make this up, but it also, there's a subtle form of these five elements, which actually go into making up this material object as well. Okay. So, so there's a subtle form, even for something as dense as matter. I and mean, there's also a subtle form for us with our bodies as well, too. And so a kind of materiality is because there's subtle materiality and there's, you know, very gross physical materiality. Yes. I like growth, like Plotinus yes. with the body. He was like, it's gross. It's... Yes. <laughs> but then I like that you say earth, air, water. And that's why we love um, an earthy. I've had a walk in New York before I came to San Marcos. And before I left, I took this walk and on the walk, it was still cement. And I looked where I wasn't supposed to go on my right. And it was all blocked off, but it was all, it was some kind of, uh, they were doing some work there, but it was all earth. And, it, and in one second, when I looked through the fence uh -huh. where it said, do not enter, <laughs> it was, it brought me back to when I was five years old and moved to New York and everything was earth and dirt and the, the roads were dirt. We were new there. Everything was dirt and it felt so Alive. almost home. Yeah. Primal and pure and. And I think when we get to the sky or the ocean or 
that's why we feel so good at the beach or or a lake and the rhythms because it brings us out of our conceptual mind right. to maybe one concept one really big one or yeah 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 that's good no yeah. no, I think, no that's really good i mean this idea that uh, i mean i think almost everybody who's a human um gets a lot out of nature you know yes. like uh, you know, there's something about you know trees and like the sunlight on the trees and like the earth and I think every is there a purity every, to it like a pure like it's untouched a little bit you know maybe, I mean maybe that's it I mean it may also be just that um I mean maybe it comes down to that because uh you know uh, there's I think it has its own sort of life force which you you know the sort of kind of yes. life even in even even in clay, even in, you know, but, um, but maybe because it's not as sort of, maybe you're right, because it's not as manipulated by us, yes. it sort of retained, you know, I mean, but it is it true that you can take something the human like mind. It's not filtered through it. Like the pen is filtered through the human mind, AI, yeah. like you said, with Ray Kurzweil, who I used to love, <laughs> um, <laughs> is fil- it's all filtered through the mind, but an untouched forest. Like I stayed yeah. at Raymond Smullyan's house. I don't know if you're a fan. Raymond Smullyan know. was, and I was, he, he, do you know him? I don't know his him. Book. I've heard it. I don't know everyone else you're talking about. He wrote, everyone he, else, but. he wrote, um, what is the name of this book? And and then it would say, by the author of this book needs no title. And he was this <laughs> long haired, white uh, haired, bearded idealist uh, talking about what you're talking about. And him and Hofstetter would clash, the materialist and okay. the idealist. And he went to Indiana and they would talk at Bloomington. But I stayed at his house. And when I would go in his woods behind the house, it wasn't a park. It was the yeah. raw woods of nature. It was Whitman's yeah. uh, nature in New York. And it was it was this untouched, not filtered through the mind woods. When a bird flew out of it, it wasn't a bird that was... Uh, with a little thing on its on its on it on its leg or any you know it was raw nature so i think yeah pure well i don't know the right word well well i mean let's say uh, yeah sure let's hang on to that i i'm not i'm not sure yet what it is that makes nature so powerful but i'm willing to entertain your particular theory as you know at, at least at a minimum a very plausible That's right. one that it's a pure yeah. Uh, yeah, that there's a purity, to, but but I don't know. I'm, I'm not a hundred percent, you know, there that. Oh yeah, that's the that's what's causing it. But um, but it's definitely something we t- t- put it on the put it on the list of what are the possible reasons for this sort of profound beauty of nature. I mean, you're right though. It's like wow, you know, um, you know, yeah. I don't know what else. You know, I don't really know what other sort of. Um, we we could think about it, you know. But there, but with beyond a doubt, phenomenologically, what we know is that it is the case that nature has this sort of thing that you don't really see um, in like a pen. I mean, you can sort of change a pen <laughs> yes, by giving it a certain amount of love. You know, you love this pen so much and then it starts to glow, you know? Yes, yes. Um, and you know, and sometimes it'll even glow, not just to us, but sometimes it'll even glow to, to, to other people as well. You yes. know, so- uh, so, you Wait, know, so, now so, can we jump into one of the greatest things in your book, I thought, one of the greatest, like this is it to me. This is where we have to plant the flag. When you talk about, you stare at a pen, I don't, I'll just start it and then you just take over. I just want to, like you stare at the cup. Now the cup is not conscious. Yeah. But we would say it's made of consciousness at least maybe or something, but it's not conscious like, like I am or a dog or you. Like it's not conscious, but you talk about this amazing thing, which I think is so beautiful that if you stare, especially at a symbol, especially something in nature or these religious symbols, maybe the Ohm sign or a statue. Uh, I used to, as an atheist like Daniel Dennett, be drawn to Ingmar Bergman's suffering Christ on the cross. And I didn't buy into Jesus at all. But when I saw the cross and the sad in these Bergman black and white Swedish movies, I felt something inside and I would deny it, but I felt it. And I tell the truth now. So there's something there. And you're saying in the book, if we focus, maybe a veil drops. Uh, well, okay. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, this is good. This is good. I mean, it's even, it's even more lively than a veil dropping. Yes. It's more. It's more that you because, because we're sort of interdependent, right? So what we're saying here is that um, 
you know, because everything is made of consciousness by, um, by sort of, you know, giving attention to, and, uh, you know, the sort of the pen or the cup, what you're, you, what you, or a statue in a, in a, in a church, what yes. you're actually doing is you're allowing its inner, um, chit to sort of like the consciousness that, which is already latent in it, you, you sort of like addressing it as you, it starts to wake up, you know, yes. so, you know, like and, a and beautiful that, picture sometimes like that. Yeah. Like I example. see people they and they and they and they light up. So yeah. something's happening there and you're saying go deep enough yeah. and switch the perception, do there's a shift yeah. there, but yes. maybe and, and certain we, things do it. Yes, yeah, so, okay. So this is a really great thing to think about. And what's wonderful about the way Abhinav Kota talks about it as well is that okay, the the sort of the minimum sort of um, and I, I remember having this conversation with a student in class as well at one point, you know, where um, what we usually think is like, oh, well, you're sort of projecting onto the icon. You're projecting onto that cross yes. in the church. And so that's why it seems alive to you. Okay. Step. However, this is not what Abhinav is saying. He's not saying that, and he's not even saying that you take your, and because uh, some people say this as well too, you take your sort of energetic life force and you put it into the cup or the cross in a church, you know, or the statue of Mary. And so that makes it come alive. He's not saying either one of those things. He's no. actually saying something a little different. He's saying that it has its own innate sort of reality, which by addressing, you allow it to come forth. Now, what I love about his his sort of interpretation, his theory on this particular phenomenon is that um, it's really not colonialist. Like all these other models that we get have a sort of a little bit of colonialism in them. It's about us putting into thing and we make it become, yes. come alive. Whereas what he's actually saying is that we really do live in a reality that's populated by all these other sort of um, life force energy entities. Okay. I mean, okay, this is actually an interesting place for me to sort of bring it back to your sort of, um, to your sort of like little mushroom journeys, right? Because, um, one of the things that's come up in our class that um, we were learning about, you know, psychedelics and um, is that particularly for DMT, less so for psilocybin, but also for psilocybin at times, you know, Terrence McKenna talks about all these little elves and yes. these entities people meet. Okay. And so, and, and when people talk about these, what they realize um, on these trips is that, um, they're not projections of their mind. They're not sort of Jungian or Freudian sort of like um, repressed um, uh, energy symbols. You know, they're not even repressed from like, you know, a lineage of like several generations. They're actually their own beings that a person just happens to sort of run into when their own minds using William James's filter theory, when their own minds open up enough so that they can sort of be in this um, yeah. other yeah, so, they so they're there. Yeah, they're you at a certain level, you're saying you will be greeted by these subtle angels or machine elves or whatever it is that the light or something yeah. will come to you. Like in the yeah. movie Contact, remember? Did you see that movie? Uh, no, I didn't see that movie. With Jodie Foster. At the, yeah, she finish. goes, it's it's a long story, but she, go, she goes in a ship in order to contact the, the UFO, that the UFO... The mm -hmm. alien sent the plans. And when she goes in, she has this giant experience. And it's her father who died, greets her. But then after a little while, he opens himself up and he's just light. And and the light says, we thought you'd understand that form a little better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But maybe you're not saying that. Maybe you're saying this is beyond that. I, I don't know if I'm... Well, but, um, yeah, well, and... and yeah, sorry, good. No, 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 no. I think you're, I think that's right. I think, and I think you get both of these. I think that you can, I mean, for Abhi Nebuchadnezzar, the yeah, it'll ultimately be this light and the light takes on this form. And that may, I'm having a sense that you've had these kinds of experiences that you met these yes. other entities and those entities were like, well, we just thought, you know, really our forms are, you know, insectoid, but we know that you don't like insectoid forms as humans. Yes. So no, we're just looking, we're looking like your dead uncle, you know, Perfect. but- but then there's light, yeah. You know, so, so you've had these experiences, okay? So, um, um, you know, so, but, so what I've been mean, saying is, yes, that's one of the things you'll see. But there's also this other thing that is on this sort of medium level, okay? So that's the highest level, right? Where there's, you know, it's just pure consciousness, okay? Yeah. But there's this medium level where there are machine elves, and they don't, you know, and they don't necessarily sort of like, you know, want to sort of, um, 
you know, do what you want them to do, or they're not right. part of they're totally not. not. not yeah, totally. they're not following your agenda per se. No. They have their own intentionality, their own agenda. You know, and so and that's sort of um and and I think that's partly also what Abino says with this and that and you can and that is I think you know what what again what is really important about that is is this particular view is is the least um colonial imperialist of all these views because it allows the other to actually genuinely be an insectoid or you know to be a machine elf or to be you know i mean and i think of viveros de castro you know his work on um you know this sort of indigenous sort of world view where he talks about you know everything's a person like animals we don't think of animals as persons but in this in this world reality animals are persons too you know yeah. and um, and his george, I mean, george collin would say that oh yeah okay. he used to say cats are good people too yeah, yeah, yeah. And and yeah. It, it makes sense to me too. It's sort of like, okay, all of these things are people here, you know. And what about this? Okay, that one's not a person until you until you actually address it enough that it wakes up. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, so like um it's it won't be a, and that's not being able to thinking. It's like the Martian can be covered over and which is also important. And the reason why it's also important is because truth be told, we do live a good chunk of our life with matter which has not which is not um allowing its innate vimarsha its innate sort of like that's great capacity for subjectivity to express itself there's a yes. lot of things like this pen you know yes. or you know uh chat gpt at this point right. it's not, you know and that goes back a to butterfly is easy we yeah, like a butterfly we love yeah. a cardinal yeah <laughs> exactly no that's exactly right yeah yeah. That's exactly, yeah so um yeah so yeah so um yeah. And well, how much would you say uh when when I saw this paradigm pop, it was exactly not a little bit, but exactly like a dream, exactly like Dorothy, exactly like Alice. That is this on medicine? Say again. I'm sorry. This was on medicine? On medicine and the first time, no medicine. Okay. Then medicine matched it four years later. Okay. But in two thousand nine, no medicine. Mm -hmm. Just total netty netty, uh -huh. uh, not this, not this, not this. And my teacher just guided me. I was so ready, and it felt like death. Uh -huh. And I thought I was totally and I had and there was a choice there to talk about free will to stop and grab my phone and maybe write my girlfriend <laughs> or go pet my little beagle that was sleeping. But it was when she, my girlfriend was out at a movie. And my beagle was sleeping, 2009, total apophatic, total darkness, total quiet, total let go of everything, no medicine. and But a guy who was really always knocking on things and knowing 99.9%, .9%, but I clung to that 0.01 or whatever. I clung to the, I would always cling to something. And this was letting go. And I felt a, a rip where you the the choice was grab the phone or you go and and it felt like the calvary was coming and pulled me through as i let go just like a ripple letting go of its last ripple and becoming the lake and yeah and it was total blackness beyond the color black and pure love and bliss okay. and then back and then medicine four years later okay that matched it okay okay good and then trying to get a baseline because you slip uh i'm a big advocate of that slips it i mean maybe some people get it and it stays but i couldn't plant the flag i can get somewhere but then i was 10 steps back and then two steps up and eight steps back and yeah. over and over until it came closer <laughs> and closer and your yeah. book helped me get closer and closer uh -huh. to yeah. this so simple thing that this is this yeah yeah, yeah. It is it it's not outside of it it's is yeah. it yeah yeah now that's that, that yeah, sounds like a wonderful mystical experience. Um, okay, one of the things I often uh think and um you know and I you know try to convey um is this idea that um we're here for a reason, you know. So you're in a body. Yeah. Body's I used to so, hate that. Yeah, yeah. But 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 you know, it's it's good to sort of um, you know, uh there's no real need to sort of rush to the space beyond the body this sort of the void and shunyata emptiness of you know of um 
of, you know, being beyond this body, like that's there and it will never go away, you know, but, but you came here for a particular reason to sort of integrate this, integrate, you know, to bring these two together and you can probably yeah. get more bang for your buck <laughs> by actually sort of, I love that. by actually sort of, you know, um, playing with this idea of the body. I mean, this, this transcendent state, um, is not ever going to go away. That is sort of like a you know, and that this would be Shankara, right? That's the baseline. It's not yes. ever not here. Is this suit when you write about when you talk about up and out compared to up and? Yeah. Can you just go into that? That's what you're doing, I think. Yes, not um, just up and out and no yeah. more body, yeah, which yeah. will happen eventually, maybe. Yeah, but, yeah. But now bring it well, back. Right. Oh. Well, one of the things I've been mean, on as well is that it's um it's not really ever beyond leap without a body because one of the things he says is that the universe it's the, the the universe itself is the body of the highest absolute you know yeah. so basically what you're going to do is go to bigger and better bodies you know yeah. and, I met I met a guy here who there's a little magic shop but magic isn't magic like what I it's, it's medicine not side of hand it's not side no, of hand no no it's all medicine. <laughs> Yeah. And you would love the name. It's it's a pun on Atlantis. So it's and I live by Lake Atalan, okay. which Huxley loves. So it's Atalantis. Oh, very Atalantis. nice. And it's all the medicine in chocolate and this and that. And I met someone there who was like the owner's boyfriend. And he had just done, and I think you'll love this, five MEO DMT 30 days in a row for the whole month. Wow. And now we're talking. And I, my part of me wants to talk about the Godhead, like this. But what he showed me very clearly in two seconds was there's a bot. <laughs> He's sitting in front of, like, bring it. And you, he learned more about everything you're talking about. How do you come back to the body? How do you come back home to this? But maybe it's more subtle and it's not quite as solid and gross as we thought yeah. it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. That's really good. Yeah, very interesting. Very interesting. <laughs> it's good. Yeah. Good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So I have only like about five more minutes, I think. Yes. Yes. Uh, can I ask a few questions? Like, yes. are you saying, I didn't get to ask this. Um, this is, I said this earlier, this is emptiness is form. Form is emptiness in a way you know, you're showing. The heart uh, sutra, or how would you make a distinction? No, this is a good. This is a really good question. Um, uh, I mean, okay, so I'll go to Abhinava again, and one of the things he says is that um, emptiness, shunyata. Okay, he he maps it to the body as well, also. Okay, and it's a state. It's a state of emptiness, and so each the five senses, you know, and then shunyata. These are all. These are sort of states of mind that we sort of can get into. And the thing about emptiness is that. Um, he says that emptiness is um, always full. It's always it's always sort of, Beautiful. and I, when I think about that in terms of this sort of what we know about the quantum vacuum, it's empty, yes. but it's all, but it's really, it's just about always, you know, just about to bubble forth these sort of, this Jack fullness. Kerouac called it the jam-packed void. Yes, that's, that's it. That's perfect. Yeah. Yeah, yes, that is actually really right in line with what he says. It's it's yeah. it's, it's it's totally it's like you know so um, emptiness is form, form is emptiness. Um, I mean that's coming out of this particular context of of you know this sort of majemika and um and you know and I think that um I think it's not quite that per se you know that I mean I was not quite saying that emptiness is form I think emptiness is sort of um uh emptiness is not really empty okay um and right. that's because, yeah yeah you know and so but um but it's you know but it's you know and it's also depends on what we think of form is you know like whatever yeah. Yeah, so that's part of it too, you know. <laughs> okay, At this relax. point, yeah, I don't know what to say outside of thank you. Uh, I want to tell everyone a little bit about what you what you did when you were younger. You were in Louisiana and you would swim with the alligators. So, oh, no, we didn't really just you know, in we case. Like, <laughs> whenever there was an alligator, someone would like shout "gator," and we'd all just sort of run. They were around, the so I'm just saying you're a courageous <laughs> woman. <laughs> no, I'm not that courageous, but um, yeah. Um, okay. Well, I mean, there's this is super super fun. Uh, maybe yeah. to be continued. There's probably lots more things we can talk about. Um, I have. To I would love that. to do it again next year. We'll we'll see where we're at and and dig drill deeper. Okay. Good. Yeah. And sorry we didn't get to talk about um 
Surya Vijnana, the sun science, but maybe next time. Yeah, well, a cliffhanger. Yeah, yeah, sorry, but you know. <laughs> yeah, that would be great. Okay. Thank okay. you, Lorelai. Yeah, thank you, and Jane. And I'll put a link to your books and, and okay. to your talks and everything in the description, and I'll see you sometime next year. That sounds good. Okay, okay, good. See happy, you. happy travels. Okay, bye. Bye.